Hi everyone, welcome to our fish behavior and reproduction video. So by the end of this video, you should be able to describe the different types of fish migrations, list factors that may affect timing of fish reproduction, explain the function and give examples of different reproductive strategies, including sexual dimorphism, ovipary and vivipary, internal versus external development, protection of young and sex change. So first, migration. So there are different types of migration seen in different species of fish. The first type, anadromous or anadromy, is when fish spend most of their life in the sea and they migrate to fresh water to breed. So examples of anadromous fish are Chinook salmon, striped bass, lamprey. And in order to be anadromous, fish have to have an adaptation to prevent diffusion of water into the body. Because if they've been living in salt water, all of a sudden they move to fresh water. The tendency would be for water to, um, to kind of flood in. Um, and so they have adaptations to prevent that. Catadromy or catadromous fish are freshwater fish that spawn in the sea. And the one example of catadromy is the American eel. And so kind of the flip-flop, they must have the adaptation to prevent water loss. So when they go from fresh water to salt water to prevent all the water from diffusing out of their body. And most of that, um, adap the adaptation to kind of regulate water loss um, or water gain, it is controlled by hormones. Diadromy or diadromous fish are, so sometimes diadromous, that term is used to explain just any fish that exists in salt water and fresh water. So anadromous and catadromous are more specific um, ways to be diadromous, but there's some fish that are diadromous without regard to breeding season. So they're sometimes in seawater, sometimes in freshwater. And bull shark is an example of that. The North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences actually has a specimen of a bull shark that it was said to be found in a creek in coastal North Carolina. So they can be found in fresh water. So timing of reproduction, depending on the species of fish, is influenced by different factors. It could be temperature, it could be day length, it could be pH of the water. There are some species that spawn once and then die, like the Chinook salmon. And you think, well, what is the adaptation there? Well, remember, salmon are going upstream to spawn. That takes a ton of energy. And so what they do is they don't spawn until like seven, eight years old. They build up lots and lots of energy, lots and lots of resources, so they can lay lots and lots of eggs or fertilize lots and lots of eggs. And they go and lay it all out there all at one time. And so um, it's worth it to, to use all the energy at once. That's um, the adaptation that has kind of worked best over evolutionary time for that species. Now, other species, will reproduce multiple times over several years, an example being bass. And really, um, most species of fish reproduce multiple times. The age of sexual maturity varies. So like the Chinook salmon, there are some species that have a pretty high adult survival rate and they have later sexual maturity. Those that have not as high adult survival rate and where there's a growing population, they reach sexual maturity earlier on. In some species of fish, you see sexual dimorphism. Sometimes that difference is in size. More often, the size difference you see in fish is where adult females are larger than adult males. Um, sometimes males are larger, and that's when they're competing for females. So a lot of times with um, with fish, there's one female and multiple males um, can mate with her, but if they're competing for a female, the males might be larger than the females. In some fish, there's sexual dimorphism in color. And so this is an example here where in breeding season, the fish change color and you can see the progression from non-breeding to breeding coloration. 
guppies, stickleback fish, they exhibit this color change. One from our list that exhibits a different kind of sexual dimorphism is the blue head chub, where they have these breeding tubercles on their head. They're like bony projections that kind of pop out of the skin and then they'll retract back in when breeding season is over. The head of the blue head chub gets much more blue during br breeding season too. And that's only with the males, the tubercles and the blue head. For angler fish, there is sexual dimorphism in size and in feeding behavior. So that when we see angler fish, like the big fish with the thing, it's always a female. This is the male anglerfish. It's parasitic and it's teeny tiny. And you think about what is the adaptive advantage here? Well, where do anglerfish live? Deep down at the bottom of the ocean where it's completely dark. How do you find a mate <laughs> when it's so dark and their, um, you know, their reaction to anything swimming by is to eat it? Well, latch on to the back of the female, become a parasite sucking nutrients from her. And then when breeding season comes along, if you're attached on there, you can be relatively certain that it is the sperm of this male that's gonna fertilize this female's egg. So pretty wild adaptation. And the, the anglerfish is like the wild adaptation example for every different thing <laughs> that we do in, in class here. So pairing behavior in fish, most do not have a long lasting pair bond in a lot of the other vertebrate taxa, we see different variations of that, but fish usually not a long lasting pair bond. Most teleos fish, so bony, um, bony ray finned fish, the females deposit eggs into the water and then sperm are deposited by males on top of the eggs. So that's oviparous, where the young develop outside the mother's body. And that development time for the eggs can range from two days to several months. Um, and one female may mate with many males. And so that might mean she might not ever actually come in contact with the males, but the eggs are deposited. And then multiple males might um, deposit sperm on top of those eggs. So in one kind of clutch of eggs, there might be multiple different um, fathers that, that fertilize those eggs. Most chondroichthys, so the sharks, rays, skates, most of them have internal fertilization. And so their young develop within the mother's body and that's called viviparous. So kind of live birth, right? And that time of development is generally six to 22 months. So much longer for that internal development. And what allows for internal fertilization in the chondroichthys is modified pelvic fins called claspers. And so this is an example of claspers here. Males have claspers, females don't. Male inserts claspers into the female's cloaca and sperm is transported along them to assure that internal fertilization of eggs. Then there's internal development and live birth. So protection of developing young, most fish do not spend time and energy <laughs> protecting their developing young, but some do. So some will hide their eggs or build nests. Some e examples of that are trout and salmon. Some have internal development until the, the young are born and live birth. And that's the sharks that we were just talking about. Maternal mouth brooding is a pretty cool example of protecting developing young. So <clears throat> females take the eggs into their mouth. They inhale sperm. So the eggs are fertilized while in the female's mouth. The eggs develop in the female's mouth and they're protected. And so they're held in there until they hatch. And then the live young swim out of the mama's mouth. Sea catfish are an example of this. There's a picture there, um, pretty neat. The brood pouch, which we talked about earlier, uh, the male seahorse where the female deposits the eggs in the male's brood pouch. So it looks like the male is giving live birth to the little seahorse babies, but the eggs were deposited in there. They're just developing in there. 
we touched on sex change in fish in the previous video, but getting into a little more of the details, there's a couple different ways. Um, there's synchronous hermaphrodites in some fish where both male and female organs are present at the same time. There's more kind of more likely to be found in fish species is what's called sequential hermaphrodites. And this is where sex change happens over time. Within that group, what's most likely to happen is called protogeny where female fish turn into male fish. And it usually happens when there's no longer a breeding male present. So protogeny is male, sorry, female first, female turning into male. Protandry is male fish changing into female fish. So that proto word part means first. So first um, female, first male. And again, like we said earlier, there's a lot of research going on about this now. We continue to learn more and more and understand that more and more fish exhibit sex change. And they have, in a research setting, been able to kind of force that sex change by taking away a breeding male. Then um, kind of the largest, most dominant female becomes the new breeding male. So it's really an interesting concept. Um, and like I said, more being done. So if you're interested in researching fish, maybe this is a good, good area for research for you. All right, growth and development of fish. So for oviparous fish, so fish that hatch out of an egg, they have four different life stages. So their embryonic stage is when they're in the egg. Then as they hatch out of the egg, they're larval. They're usually really little. Um, they're basically eating and growing during that time. These are all larval stages. And then um, when they get to the juvenile stages, when they look like an adult, like all the, all the parts are there, the physiology looks like the adult, might still be smaller than an adult. The thing that differentiates a juvenile and an adult is that the juvenile is non-breeding. So when they get to being able to spawn, that's when they're considered an adult. But juvenile just looks like a kind of a mini adult. In viviparous fish, remember the sharks, the young are born as juveniles. So they're just mini adults. There's no larval stage. So there's juvenile. And then when they get to be spawning age, then they're considered adult. All right, time to go back. Make sure that you can check off each of these objectives. Describe the different types of fish migration, anadromous, catadromous, all that good stuff. List the factors that may affect timing of fish reproduction and explain the function and give examples of different reproductive strategies, including sexual dimorphism, ovipary, vivipary, internal versus external development, protection of young, and sex change. All right, so instead of a joke today, we have fish trivia. So what do you think is the longest lived fish? Think about it. Probably not the fish you've got at the fair. Ready? It's the lake sturgeon. They can live up to 150 years. These are one of those examples that has the ganoid armor scales. Must be working if they can live 150 years. We don't have them in North Carolina, but close. So they're mostly in the Great Lakes region up into Canada in the Midwest. What's neat also is that lake sturgeon are a source of caviar. So that's just your little bit of fish trivia for the day. I hope you have a great day and I look forward to seeing you in class.